We are continuing our gospel lessons in Matthew, turning now to Matthew chapter 5. I would sort of wrap this up by saying Jesus is saying, you are not pointless. Matthew chapter 5. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you. When people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Oh God, we thank you for this word, for this teaching for the way in which you gather your people together and show us where God is. Open up this word for our understanding today. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. This gospel passage is probably one of the best known, or at least the beginning of the best known and memorable of all Jesus' ministry. It begins what is known as the Sermon on the Mount, called that because as Matthew tells the story, Jesus pauses from this endless work of ministering to people. He has been teaching and curing and casting out demons. And as I imagined it, maybe he stopped for a drink or a a bite to eat or for a well-deserved time of rest. And I imagine that Jesus turned around looking and seeing the crowd and it made him realize this is a turning point for his ministry and for the ministry of all of those who agreed to follow him. And so Jesus turns, Matthew tells, and he walks up a mountain. The scripture doesn't exactly say where this mountain is, but it does tell us that He made a home near Capernaum, which is on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. And faithful Christians and pilgrims have designated an area where this could have been, based on his home in Capernaum. And they chose a likely spot, it's a mountain, and now known as the Mount of Beatitudes, just west of Capernaum, where standing on that mountain you can look over the Sea of Galilee. When we were in Israel four years ago, we found, we went to this Mount of Beatitudes. It was on the designated tour that we were on, and we found small groups of people scattered all around the grounds of the Mount of Beatitudes, outside the Church of the Beatitudes, outside the monastery that is there, many of them in the midst of Bible study and prayer, just as Jesus would have gathered his own. Our group did that too. We stopped and we We read this scripture, which I was asked to read, and we prayed. The place just inspires that. Jesus turns from the crowds, and he heads up the mountains, and he sat down gathering the disciples that he had at that point. Not all 12 yet, but he gathers his disciples. Matthew says that the disciples are Jesus' main audience. But we're going to read just three chapters later that the crowds have followed him also. 
And maybe they're standing at a distance, but maybe not so distant. But they are fascinated with his words. Scholars have called this section of the Beatitudes the preamble or the overture for the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is just getting started. Jesus begins with a word, blessed. Blessed. Now, should we be tempted to get our pens out and start taking notes? Jesus begins to rattle off nine blessings here. Let's pause to consider what they really are. Put away your pens, Jesus says. This is not a to-do list. You do not have to memorize this. This is in order to find blessing or know who is blessed, know this, that rather than a checklist on how to be blessed, this is the way things are when God's in charge. The poor are a people greatly blessed because they are taken care of in God's kingdom. The meek are blessed to have everything they need in God's kingdom. The powerless are blessed where God's in charge because they have nothing to fear. Don't take notes, Jesus says, just pay attention. In the place where God's in charge, you don't have to be. This is lesson one. First things you need to know is this is the way it is in the kingdom of God. It's a place where you've agreed to follow, and this is what it's like, Jesus is saying. This is not, if you want to serve this kingdom, you must strive to be or you must learn to be merciful, poor, meek. This is what it's like in the place where God's in charge. The poor are beneficiaries of the riches of God's kingdom. Those who are broken in spirit find healing and wholeness in God's kingdom. The ones who hunger in body and in spirit are filled where God is reigning. The peacemakers are the ones who have sat at the feet of the heavenly father. The least win. They get it. They are the ones who know and who recognize God. And you, well, Jesus says, you're going to be part of this. You will tell this story of God's kingdom. We don't hear any response from the disciples or a peep from the crowd. They are speechless. They are, as I imagine it, just there are crickets. That's all that can be heard. Jesus' words are rather extraordinary, unlike anything else that they've heard in their synagogues. Jesus' beatitudes are nonsensical. They don't make sense in, in the sense that on the terms projected by the powerful and the rich and the comfortable. That is, if we are honest, they are nonsensical to most of us. We hear the word blessed and we have something in our mind of what the blessed life looks like. How can the weak be powerful? How can peacemakers thrive in a world tinged with violence? How can persecution be a site of blessed transformation? We thought we knew the blessed life and what it looked like, but now Jesus is saying this is it. It is where the poor are, where the meek are, where the brokenhearted are. Hang on to your hats. This is a roller coaster. Jesus is warning them. The Apostle Paul says as much in that reading from Corinth where Dan read earlier and Paul describes the teaching and the life and the sacrifice of Jesus and he says it's foolishness to the world. When the world looks at Jesus, it just doesn't make sense. It's crazy talk. 
Paul says God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak to shame the strong. Professor Baron Mullis writes, Jesus concludes the Beatitudes by saying essentially this, God's way runs so counter to much of what the world expects that those who dare to engage the world on God's terms by blessing the peacemakers, blessing the poor, blessing the pure, blessing the merciful, blessing the righteous. Well, people who choose to engage the world on that can expect to be ridiculed for it because the world doesn't talk that way. They can expect to be belittled, made mockery of, and worse, persecuted. In this Sermon on the Mount, in this, in this overture, in this preamble, Jesus wants those who would be his followers to understand this. Though Jesus brings peace and God's love and reconciliation, the world will not welcome it with open arms because this is hard teaching. It is counter-cultural. Park Lake's book club and, and also my own personal book club just read a new historical fiction by Pip Williams called The Dictionary of Lost Words. It's set in Oxford, England at the turn of the 19th century with the world at war, with the suffragette movement just beginning to take a foothold. And in the middle of all this, an erudite group of men gathered to begin collecting, defining, and cataloging words, which when compiled will be the Oxford English Dictionary. The story centers around Esme, the daughter of one of the lexicographers who is working on the dictionary. From a young age, Esme would sit under her father's word sorting table and she would play, a place where her father could keep an eye on her. Occasionally, slips of paper would fall to the ground containing words that were submitted for consideration in this newly forming dictionary. Some words were immediately retrieved and grabbed up, and others were forgotten or ignored. Esme began collecting these forgotten words and storing them in a trunk in her home, even before she could read. There was something special about those words. The words meant something. And it began her lifelong curiosity about words and, and which words matter and why they matter. And she began to wonder about the discarded words and, and words that were never considered worthy of writing down, certainly never considered worthy of adding to the new dictionary. Esme's best companion was the young housemaid whose name was Lizzie. And Lizzie was uneducated and illiterate. But Esme soon realized that Lizzie had a vocabulary all of her own. And that many of Lizzie's words were not included in this new dictionary. In fact, they were not good enough for that dictionary, not worthy of consideration. But Esme began recognizing their worth, and she began collecting these humble words herself. And Lizzie began to introduce Esme to her community of grocers at the market and housemaids and tradesmen. And Esme began writing down unfamiliar words listening to their use, writing their definitions. She appealed to her father and Dr. Murray, who was the dictionary's creator, to consider other words and the, the people behind those words as worthy of being included in this new Oxford Dictionary. But the scholars were simply looking for words that had more elevated status that were in writing previously. But Essie continued listening, writing down stories, tucking them away. 
And she began to appreciate the people and the lives behind those words. People and their stories that were being overlooked by the men in the scriptorium. But one's words that would soon be at the center of Esme's own world. After some year, her collection of words would be bound as a small book with limited publication. But she proudly showed it to Lizzie who exclaimed, is that our book? Are those our words? Show me where my word is. Show me where my name is and the definition I gave you. And Esme turned to Lizzie's word and read her the word and its definition and its use and her name. And Lizzie beamed, feeling heard, and seen and loved. She said, that's my word. That's me. I wonder if Jesus knows exactly what he's doing by beginning his teaching using a very simple word. Blessed. Blessed. One that was filled with cultural significance and expectation. And Jesus takes that word and uses it and opens it up and turns it on its head. Blessed, 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 bless. Dr. Kate Bowler teaches history of Christianity in North America at Duke Divinity School. And ten years ago she wrote a book that was called Blessed. A History of American Prosperity Gospel. Recently, Dr. Bowler took time to reflect on it. And she says, at the time that I wrote this, it was the very beginning of a cultural phenomenon of people using the word blessed or hashtag blessed. She said, They'd use it to describe the feeling of spiritual accomplishment, meaning I was in the right place at the right time, hashtag blessed. Or look at me on the beach in a barely there bikini shot, hashtag blessed. Or in all of it, What she she goes on to say, in all of it, what it did was convinced us that it created an only perfection needs to be celebrated culture. Only that effortless, when your life comes together, are you hashtag blessed. The truth is the word blessed doesn't mean this. Blessing is there to mean the ability to sync up our own lives with our real lives with an experience of God's time and approval. So we can bless everything, not just the moments that we have it together. So instead of hashtag blessed, let's think about this, she says. Blessing the hard, blessing the tired, Blessing the moments that we don't have it together. Maybe our pain-filled days, our garbage days, our ordinary, dumb, or wonderful days may also be blessed. We are opening a little door in our minds to say God is here too. Where these are, Jesus says, God is. If you are looking for where God is working, pay attention to these. Jesus climbs the mountain. He sits and he says, first thing I want you to know is that God does things a little differently than the world does. Pay attention to that. There will always be folks who have a hard time recognizing the freedom that comes with letting go of control, letting go of things, letting go of what makes us comfortable. That strength shows itself in vulnerability and that safety comes from trust and mutual regard. 
But in this passage, Jesus points us to recognize that God's kingdom isn't a place far away, but is found wherever we honor each other as God's children, wherever we bear one another's burdens, wherever we bind one another's wounds and meet each other's needs. To be human is to be inescapably fragile and vulnerable, and it turns out that the surprising character of God isn't to reject these things, rather to gather them all into a divine embrace. We have a chance to serve daily bread this week, and thinking about that reminded me of a serving lunch many years ago, and I was aware at, of the counter between us who were serving and those who were going to walk through for lunch and for a hot meal. I was making a conscientious effort to look into the eyes of those who were coming for a meal, and one man came through, and I handed him a plate, and I said to him, how are you? And he said, God is good. I knew that to be the beginning of an um, antiphonal give and take. And I responded to him all the time. And then I looked down. And he said, all the time. Emphatically. This man who lives on the street, who, who works low-paying jobs, who struggles with physical and mental health, health all the time. And I looked back up at him, I, my voice was almost a whisper, and I said, God is good. And he nodded, affirming the truth that we both spoke, and he thanked me for his meal, and he continued down the line. Perhaps we can practice looking for the kingdom of God in new ways this week. The places where God shows up, where we recognize undeniably that God is in charge, even though we are not. As we collect our canned goods for the Super Bowl, as we sit with friends who are going through difficult times, as the name of somebody floats across our minds and we offer prayer as we ourselves are struggling with health and direction and meaning. How is God showing up when we are no longer self-sufficient? Here is our blessing. In all this, we who follow Jesus are truly hashtag blessed. Amen.